Thank you, Dmitry, for this wonderful, generous introduction. I feel really honored. And I actually, I, I, this is what I was thinking these two days, that I feel so happy and honored to be invited here. I'm really grateful to the organizers uh, who invited me to come to Central European University uh, once again. I think it's my third time that I'm here, and each time I, I find something new, something interesting here, and I hope that this collaboration continues in the future. So, um, um, so let's start with this idea of all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. I don't know if any of you recognize this quotation. <laughs> some of you probably do. Uh, and uh, this, of course, comes from The Animal Farm, uh, a once famous book uh, published in 1945 by George Orwell. And um, this phrase, of course, has become a common phrase satirizing the, this demagogical proclaimed egalitarianism, which is quickly turning into dictatorship. And yet, uh, I would say that if Orwell arguably, uh, arguably draw a very thin allegory of Bolshevism at the dawn of the Cold War, in today's world, this phrase is changing its meaning. And this is what I want to reflect and invite you to reflect together. In today's world of winning uh, neoliberal modernity with its uh, unsightly nationalist lining that we see in many countries in Europe and not only in Europe, it's more relevant probably to talk uh, about and to problematize the emasculation of these naturalized neoliberal equality discourses uh, that are still grounded in what we call in decolonial option uh, the modern colonial logic. And uh, I will try to reflect uh, today about this. What is this modern colonial logic of dehumanization and dispensability of lives? Not only human lives, but actually life as such, because it can be non-human lives as well, human and other lives. And of course, if we speak of humans, the systematic inversion of human rights. Uh, the inversion of human rights is a concept that we also use in the colonial option. It was introduced by Franz Hinkelammer, uh, a social philosopher, uh, actually very long ago, I think, he wrote the article about the inversion of human rights, and uh, we've been using it since then, and I will come back to it a little bit later. Uh, but to analyze the falsity of the present uh, equality discourse, we need to go back in history, of course, and see mm, how the enlightenment principles of liberty, fraternity, equality, uh, from the start were actually based on the silent exclusion of certain groups, uh, certain groups of people, placing them uh, closer to nature, uh, taking them outside of history, outside of modernity, and of course then depriving them of their right to equality in the, uh, ultimately. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as you probably remember, which was adopted by the UN in 1984, uh, and in many ways, uh, I mean 48, sorry, and in many ways based on the devastating experience of the two world wars, and then totalitarian regimes uh, such as Stalinism, such as Nazism, clearly reinstated that all human beings are born free, equal in dignity and rights. And generally, if we look today at the text of the Declaration, we see that it uses the word equality and equal many, many times as one of its key principles. However, uh, we all realize, of course, that even if we are born equal, we actually stop being equal very shortly after we are born. And one of the reasons for losing our equality in the modern colonial world is, of course, racism as a universal instrument of depriving people of their uh, equality together with uh, other instruments uh, such as gender and sexuality as accompanying uh, sort of intersectional tools of discrimination. And these principles are shaped together with modernity and together with its darker colonial side. And today, uh, the boundaries of racism as we all know, and uh, as I also heard uh, uh, it being discussed in one of the sessions that I attended in the morning, of course, uh, the boundaries of racism are becoming especially arbitrary, especially blurred, and at the same time, 
devastating for larger groups of people. Uh, racism is increasingly detached from the color of skin and uh, acts as a place that people occupy in the ranking of humanity, uh, or better say, the place they are assigned in this ranking. Uh, the principles of this ranking are, of course, not natural, but man-made and decided by those who have the means to authorize themselves to make this classification by those who, in Orwell's words, are more equal than others. So uh, they own this discourse and they also make the ranking of humanity. Subsequently, these divisions of humanity into those entitled to equality and those who are not have been uh, naturalized and made universal and uh, the legitimated modern uh, sort of pseudo-scientific human taxonomies such as the division of people into humans and subhumans, uh, perhaps sexually marked or racially marked, or uh, uh, to quote one of uh, our younger scholars from the colonial option whom you can see here, Nelson Maldonado Torres, he calls it misanthropic skepticism. Uh, misanthropic skepticism meaning uh, this kind of questioning their humanity, questioning the belonging to humanity uh, that he sees as one of the grounding principles of modernity and coloniality. Uh, and that's what he sa uh, says here. You can read it. Unlike uh, Descartes' methodological doubt, Manichaean misanthropic skepticism is not skeptical about the existence of the world of the normative stat status of logic or mathematics. It's a form of questioning uh, the very humanity of the colonized people. But today it's not only colonized people, it's many other groups that are, are also uh, uh, going through this misanthropic skepticism. And all racist taxonomies, of course, have been built on the grounds of this uh, misanthropic skepticism. Uh, the savage, as you remember, was identified with nature, and Caliban, to quote Shakespeare's uh, The Tempest, by definition was, of course, seen as in, uh, not capable of thinking, uh, feeling in terms of emotions, uh, only capable of uh, some kind of raw affects, uh, not capable of creating art objects in accordance with particular aesthetics. Uh, and today this logic is unfortunately revamped in the treatment of uh, new uh, groups, other groups of others, such as migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and so on. And it is very important to uncover the role of particular situated knowledges in the construction of this uh, modern colonial ontology. Uh, the issue of equality then, uh, I would say, links with the assertion of geopolitical and body political rights of those who have been controlled by the Foucauldian biopolitics and indeed were invented by the imperial, imperial knowledge based on its ontologized racial and sexual hierarchies and, uh, and differences. Uh, as demonstrated by a number of authors, the major modern division of humanity is into humanitas and anthropos. And here I'm quoting uh, uh, Nishitani Asam, a Japanese scholar who wrote a very interesting article on that several years ago. So uh, he reflects on this and how people are divided into humanitas and anthropos, uh, uh, meaning those who are marked by culture and belong to culture and those who are just biological human beings. And in this case, of course, racialization also works through gender. Colonization itself comes to be symbolized as an act of rape and violence. And there are many scholars who wrote about that. And the anthropos is constructed, as he says, as a position of the object absorbed into the domain of knowledge produced by the humanitas. The anthropos as the owned object folded into the domain of knowledge owned by the uh, humanitas is an other who does not exist ontologically. And that is, is very important, how uh, this distinction, which is totally created and invented, it's turns into the sphere of ontology, how it's ontologized. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the major issues that we have to deal if we want to discuss the question of equality and egalitarianism. Uh, the ontological erasing of the Anthropos is a universal mechanism of modernity coloniality, which we witness in the way indigenous people, refugees, migrants, or m the so-called missing citizens, if we roughly translate it into English, or in French, les citoyens manquants. Uh, and this is a, a term that was offered by 
uh, Croatian feminist living in Paris, Rada Ivekovic, it's her formulation and her recent book that is called that, Les Citoyens Manquants, and she means people who are French citizens already, but who are still seen as others and, and not belonging to, 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 the, to the state. So these are many groups that are treated this way today. Uh, and of course, in the current political climate of fragmentation and reemergence of the ultra-right, nationalist, neo-imperial, conservative rhetoric in the old Europe and the new Europe and beyond, there are more and more such undesirable groups and collectives which are dehumanized and subsequently discarded from the equality model. In the present situation of uh, imperceptible normalization of the permanent state of exception, which happens even outside the actual zones of war and conflict, more and more groups of people are turned into, or uh, could be called after Agamben and Bear lives, the new anthropos whose human rights are systematically revoked, restricted, inverted, and who are threatened, monitored, uh, regulated through certain disciplinary regimes and different forms of uh, even immobilization, we can say, such as racial, ethnic, and uh, religious profiling, identity controls of different kinds, uh, draconian mm, immigration laws as forms of excluding people from the ontological reality. Uh, the present stereotypical media representation, for example, of the Middle Eastern refugees, in multiple examples of hate speech, but also hate images, we can say, uh, manipulated by the powers competing for global and regional geopolitical dominance, is designed according to the same scenario of maximum dehumanization and turning of live people into emblems of suffering uh, and at times of aggression and threat, symbolizing the deep internal contradictions and unresolved dilemmas of the European society itself and its identity in the conditions of the declining uh, global capitalism. And uh, in Europe, uh, it's, it's, it's very alarming that we find an area of this essentialist nationalist rhetoric, which uh, even in the most egalitarian societies, the most democratic societies, is still grounded in the unresolved contradiction and fundamental contradiction, which actually Hannah Arendt defined as a contradiction between the equal rights for everyone and the advantages given to citizens, uh, and not just any citizens at that, but those who were born in the country and belong to its ethnic majority. Uh, and this even today in the globalization epoch, so to say, and this kind of globe-trotting epoch, nativity remains the main principle of citizenship and by association of belonging to the humankind. Uh, the dynamics of invisibility and hypervisibility of the others is one of the main mechanisms of exclusion today, created in and by modernity with its darker colonial side starting from the 16th century onwards and helping to maintain and reproduce the racial, sexual, religious, and other human taxonomies which are necessary for the preservation of the Western uh, dominance, and today the northern dominance, we can say. Similarly to colonized people and to indigenous people, the refugees are also placed in this taxonomy today closer to nature. Uh, they are the contemporary anthropos, naturally visible and at the same time publicly invisible, and this is an important differentiation in this case, naturally visible but publicly invisible, and that, of course, is also a quote from Hannah Arendt. Therefore, refugees and other similar groups are by definition exempt from any political action, uh, any political space or the space of appearance, as she calls it. Uh, the refugees are allowed into the space of appearance only as signs, as emblems of their own suffering and not as agents of their own emancipation and subsequent empowerment. Uh, a theorist of critical visuality, uh, Nicholas Mirzoyev, and some of you may be familiar with his books, actually echoes Arendt's reflections when he conceptualizes the other as a ghost, uh, which cannot be a modern visual subject. That is, a person who is constructed as an agent of sight and as the effect of a series of categories of visual subjectivity. So it's a ghost uh, which could not be seen in the panoptic spectrum, as he says, and it has many names in many languages, again. It can be a diasporic people, exiles, queers, migrants, refugees, Tutsis, gypsies, and I'm quoting him here, uh, Palestinians, 
Uh, the GOES is one place among many from which to interpolate the networks of visibility that have constructed, destroyed, and deconstructed the modern visual subject, end of quote. So in other words, we can say that refugees have no right to look, uh, and maybe you're familiar with another work by Mirzoev, which is uh, called The Right to Look, so they have no right to look because this right comes from power and with power. Modernity allows them to be stared at, but they are not regarded as those who can look and see in their turn. Therefore, one of the major decolonizing steps in the realm of visuality for refugees is regaining their rights to look and to return the gaze of the Western observer. As you all know very well from post-colonial theory, the latter is quite disturbing for the modern visual subject because it disrupts its dominance uh, and control opening the possibility for resistance er and eventually for re-existence of the other. The refugee can be interesting to uh, the Western or Northern observer only as an object and first of all a media object today of course. Problems start when the object becomes a human being because then it becomes necessary to treat this human being ethically and to change the paradigm of charity and civilizing mission to seeing the former object as an equal with a right to be different. And this is also very important. We're all equal, but therefore we have the right to be different. This, of course, is a very old problem of Western modernity, and more specifically of modern ethics, which needs an operation of dehumanization to take the other out of the sphere of ethics to justify any violence in relation to this other. Uh, in other words, we can say that the anthropos uh, does not exist ontologically. It is a discursive construction which is invented by the same in the process of constructing its sameness uh, in an act of enunciation, hiding the locality and corporality of the enunciator in Walter Mignola's um, kind of semiotic wording. The classification of human beings on which modernity uh, has always depended, needs a system of knowledge in which they uh, would be sustained, justified, because this classification of human beings as not quite rational, not quite mature, not quite developed, not sufficiently masculine, not quite sexually normal, uh, not quite sane or healthy, all of this stems not from the object, not from uh, the actual being, not from uh, these are the cells as such, but from the knowing subject and from the system of knowledge that the subject creates in order to uh, proclaim itself as the norm. Uh, today we witness a major shift in the geography of, uh, of reasoning from the Western man to other agents. Uh, the anthropos as a biological being or human in the guise of animals, presumably untouched by nature, uh, by, by culture, is uh, the term that was introduced by uh, Sylvia Winter, Jamaican philosopher, uh, and uh, she writes about it, and she writes about this being becoming a full-fledged acting and thinking uh, subject. And from this stems uh, her whole idea and her whole kind of uh, mm, reflection on humanism, uh, which I think is very interesting because it's a non-Western intervention into today's very fashionable discourse on post-humanism. Uh, and uh, what, I mean, we cannot ignore that because it's one of the major important discourses today, critical discourses, but it's interesting that when you look at it from the position of the colonial difference, it becomes uh, totally different. Uh, in, in the colonial, post-continental, Caribbean, Africana thought, there is an affirmation of an other humanism as a humanism of the other. Uh, an other humanism as a planetary, dialogic humanism of the former other. Uh, and this humanism is parallel to Western anti-humanism, I would say, but it grows out of a different local history, a different temple locality. It's hard to overestimate the importance of um, space, of, of this actual spatial histories and uh, spatiality in rethinking of the dichotomy of man and nature, of the importance of the geopolitics and corporate politics of being, of knowledge, of perception. Uh, and this uh, corporeal, bodily decolonization in its ontological, aesthetic, epistemic, uh, and other dimensions ha has always, of course, stood at the center of, of decolonial thought, and it especially is developing now uh, in what we're working on today. 
uh, the intersection of somatic and ideational uh, stands uh, in the center of the colonial uh, body politics or corporate politics, particularly in the way the decolonial thinkers such as Sylvia Winter or Lewis Gordon today, a very interesting Afro-Caribbean philosopher, reconceptualized Franz Fanon's concept of sociogenesis. In Black Skin, White Mask, Fanon invokes the link, the inextricable, inextricable link between knowledge perception and body, corporality, when he exclaims, uh, all my body make of me always a man who questions. So this Fanonian sociogenic principle, uh, which of course was in itself uh, an elaboration of uh, uh, William Du Bois' double consciousness, allows evaluating the originations, the genealogies, and trajectories of ideas grounded in pluriversal principles, uh, multiple principles rather than universal principles, stressing the fact that any universalization comes precisely from the refusal to see how the social affects the rational. So it was very important that he grasped this fact of the social contextuality of our identities and images when he juxtaposed also genetic principle with Eurocentric, Eurocentric ontogenic Freudian and phylogenic Darwinian principles. And I think this is a, a very important part of today's uh, rethinking of the problem of um, uh, humanism you know, formulated and reformulated from the position of the other that needs more attention. Uh, so this non-Western body is, of course, different because it's hypersensitive to the bodily dimensions of knowledge, of perception, of creativity, of sexuality, of gender, because in their experience, the highly constructed material bodily difference is constantly put forward, is constantly being essentialized and problematized, and such a person is seen or made invisible only and exclusively through this bodily difference. Um, to paraphrase William Dubois and, and Louis Gordon, uh, these are problem people. Problem people or people seen as problems, people whose humanity is always under suspicion and whose bodies act as powerful markers of difference, assimilation, rejection, resistance, and eventually re-existence. Uh, um, here I would like to quote also another book uh, written by uh, Jane Ann and Louis Gordon. Uh, they wrote it several years ago, but it's still, I think, very relevant. It's called Of Divine Warning, Reading Disaster in the Modern Age. And in this book, they actually, they wrote it before the, the so-called refugee crisis happened in Europe, but I think what they say there actually uh, means a lot for today's situation in Europe and this um, reaction of many European societies to, re to refugees. Uh, they write about heavenly bodies and crisis, and they say it summons choices to be made since the results of making wrong choices could be catastrophic. This kinds of divine warning occasion not only anxiety, the struggle of choices one must make, but also fear. Uh, and this fear and this rejection of the other who is in crisis, who and somehow brings the, the danger of catastrophe with himself or herself or themselves is what we see in many countries that do not want to associate themselves with the, with the refugee problem, so to say. Uh, and this is a reaction like, uh, yeah, we, it's not our problem. We didn't colonize them, so we don't want to have any of those in our country. Problem people, these are the new problem people, not the colonial problem people like was in the 16th century or indigenous people, but it's uh, the problem people of contemporaneity. Today, the global coloniality generates more and more groups that are made into problem people living in problem regions. Refugees, asylum seekers, migrants are such groups, uh, but not only them, but also less obvious collectives or symbolic collectives, and one of them, of course, is us, the post-socialist people, the post-Soviet and post-socialist people. For those of you who cannot read Russian, this is a real village in Russia, and it's called the future, Budushia. Yes, uh, it's like a sign at the <laughs> entrance of, of the village. And for me, it's very symbolic and important, and I use it also in my latest book that will be published uh, as a uh, as you said, soon in, 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 uh, in June, because when I was writing it, I was kind of sitting in this uh, uh, little town in Sweden and reflecting on what is going to happen with us and how we, the post-Soviet people, are made into this also problem people and new others uh, that are kind of rejected and left in the void. And for me, finally, uh, 
uh, it all concentrated in the idea of the futureless ontology. This is how I formulated this for myself. And I think this is a very important shift that happened in post-socialist countries, and especially in, in, in ex-Soviet Union. So we remain the essential outlaws of the new world, the doomed mythopoetic ogres, even if the other emphasis has shifted now to the Muslim others as the new global emblematic monsters. But uh, actually, nobody today is immune of this. And any group can become uh, this new other and this uh, new group of problem people. And as a result, more and more groups of people become increasingly subjected to this futureless ontology which allows for different degrees and forms of inequality and vulnerability, yet forces more and more groups into the permanent state of exception, war ethics, or at least a naturalized competition for the pittance from those few who are more equal than others. Uh, I actually, I coined this term, uh, futurist ontology, uh, which, uh, I, uh, as I said, will be introduced in one of the chapters in my book, Mm, because I was inspired by a friend and colleague of mine, an Australian design theorist, Tony Fry, and his idea of defuturing. He uses the idea of defuturing as a main tendency of contemporary time. Fry defines defuturing as a, quote, condition of mind and action that materially erodes planetary finite time, thus gathering and designating the negation of the being of time which is equally the taken away of our future, end of quote. Uh, so I it can, in other words, bring a positive or a negative futureless ontology. And as a theorist of design, he thinks about ontological design. So the ontological design can be also positive. Uh, we can make it positive, but uh, most of the cases today is negative because it brings the future. The human species, in spite of our mutual dehumanizing tactics, and growing economic and social asymmetries still share some elements of our ontological condition and some challenges, which in decolonial option are referred to as pluriversal rather than universal. Unfortunately, unfortunately, most of these elements and challenges today are negative, as opposed to the lighter side of modernity's original universalist formulations that nevertheless always excluded some people. They are negative in the sense that they describe the conditions of lack, loss, void, or the future in tendencies. This is what we all share today. And this is not nice, of course. Too often, the equality ideal flips into a negative equality of the future. We're all equal now at the future tendencies, uh, taking various life options away from more and more population groups. Uh, the present uh, Russian Federation official rhetoric is a very good example of this defuturing, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but I think the main shift was precisely that in socialist times, there was still this predominant idea of the future. So even, even if people suffered uh, now, they were always offered this ideal in the future, and you could read like, okay, we are not having everything we want now, there are shortages, but our children will live in this ideal utopian socialist future. But sometime, I would say in the 70s or even late 60s, this idea ended, and the socialist, uh, at least Soviet society, started to uh, look more into the past than the future. And if you look at this revival of uh, pseudo-Soviet rhetoric in Putin's discourses today, you would find and see that they never speak about future. They cannot offer any f even fake idea of the future because they are aware of the fact that there is no future yeah, for, th for the country and for the people. So they are not even selling that. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, when, when this kind of rhetoric needs to offer something to the people, they offer some symbolic kind of balance, okay, in this world we cannot be happy, but in the other world, <laughs> you know, after you, you die, maybe that there is some kind of justice there. So very often you find this kind of eschatological even conversations, and, and that's why religious discourses are so popular. So it's interesting, it's interesting how the idea of future was uh, taken uh, out uh, of this discourse. And the futuring is indeed a universal condition, but the way we experience it is, of course, very different and very personal and very pluriversal. The decolonial concept of pluriversality entails a coexistence, a correlation, interaction of many intersecting non-abstract universals uh, and um, countless options that are grounded in this particular geopolitical situation and corporate political situation. And these options, they 
are not stable, essential as they communicate with each other, uh, they leak into each other uh, instead of producing one kind of frozen abstract universal good for all. And this is very important. Uh, this is very important. When I talk about the colonial option, a lot of people cannot understand that. Why it's called an option and not studies or theory? Precisely because of that. It's an option. You don't have to take it. It's an option that we took and uh, we find it uh, relevant, but you can continue doing your own uh, theory or you know any kind of discourse. It can be post-colonial studies. It can be I don't know post-structuralism. It can be new materialism. Anything, and we are not forcing anybody to to take our position. But at the same time, we are open and always happy if people find something relevant in our uh, you know arguments. And that's why uh, we have more and more people around the world who are. Uh, taken our position, I guess. So since we don't have much time, uh, I would try to concentrate on a positive uh, part of my talk, if you can offer any in this futureless situation. Uh, what can we oppose to these ersatz equality discourses of modernity marked by coloniality of being, of knowledge, and of sensing? Uh, let's dwell at some length on the possible ways of decolonizing this neoliberal model through shifting from the will to power to the will to life. This is a model that was formulated many years ago by Enrique Dussel. Uh, from human rights to life rights, this is a model formulated by some indigenous groups, but in the colonial option by Walter Mignola. From equality to parity, that is again coming from uh, um, Amerindian groups uh, and theorized in an interesting and refreshing way by Silvio Marcos. Uh, from agonistics to deep coalitions, and here I'm quoting Maria Lugones, of course, and correlationality, again, you can find it in zillions of uh, indigenous traditions and colonized traditions, but in the colonial option, we have a wonderful scholar from Utrecht University, Rolando Vasquez, who works with that and theorizes this concept. So these are some of the models I will try to very briefly touch upon. And first is Enrique Dussel, he's a founding father of the colonial option, uh, a philosopher who lives in Mexico now. He was born in uh, Argentina. And uh, in 2006, he published a, a very good short book, 20 Theses on Politics. Uh, I, I mean, it's an English translation. He, the, the Spanish was published before, of course. So Dussel reflects on the necessity of defetishization of power and the state and suggests that even if in theory the power belongs to the people and the state must serve the people, in reality it's never the case. And he means not only capitalist and liberal neoliberal states, but also communist and socialist states. So he opts for a different future in which uh, the principle of obedient power, as he calls it, as a patista's obedient power, uh, would be finally put to life. This principle cannot be understood in the frame of the Western understanding of humanity, society, representation. Uh, what he means here by this collective we uh, is uh, not individual people, not leaders uh, in the Western understanding, but it's always uh, about the power being delegated to these leaders for only a very short period of time. So there are no, no stable leaders, no positions uh, that you can associate with leadership. And this is again something that uh, for example, Western commentators and uh, journalists don't understand when they go to Zapatistas and try to write articles about them, they don't get it, that it's a different logic altogether and different idea of democracy. Uh, so Dussel believes that power is not necessarily bad. That's an interesting thing. That's we are used to this, like power is bad, we have to fight with it. But he says institutions of power don't have to be bad. If it's a, it's a will not to power, but will to life. And if this institution serve for the people and, uh, and for nature, for, for, uh, for life in general. So um, it's not necessarily about dominance. Uh, it can be a will to life. The ontology of political power understood this way is based on uh, the collective will to life. As he says, the ability to unify the will and the goal as a requirement of practical rationality and the feasibility grounded in instrumental rationality. Uh, so he kind of questions and problematizes uh, this negative interpretation of power that we find in all classical texts from Hobbes to Lenin. Uh, and he says theorists uh, usually discuss praxis and not institutes. But institutes are not necessarily repressive. They can also serve the interests of the people. Uh, and here you see in this quotation here uh, reflects on equality. And he thinks that equality is good, but it should al always be balanced with something else. So uh, uh, the question is when equality destroys diversity, 
then it becomes necessary to defend cultural difference. And, and here we have to be very flexible, very open, and uh, very much everything has to be based on correlational principle. Uh, and I like that uh, what he comes uh, up in the end, and he says, instead of equality, fraternity, and liberty, I come up with principle of alterity, solidarity, and liberation. Uh, liberation instead of liberty is an important shift because it's, uh, it's not something ossified and frozen once and for all and given, okay, here's your liberty and now you're free. No, it's a constant process. It's nonstop. It's open. It's processual. Uh, and uh, again, to quote Zapatistas, we get any kind of truths that are not, uh, you know, stated once and for all, but any kind of answers we get while we walk, while we march. And that's a very important thing also. Uh, another decolonial thinker, Walter Mignola, uh, in one of his recent texts also writes uh, something not against human rights, but questioning this discourse of human rights. And actually he started it long ago already in the book that we co-wrote with him. There is a chapter written by Walter, who is human and human rights, uh, explaining that not, not all people are seen as human and considered to be human. But now he went even farther. He wrote a text in which he questions uh, the idea of human rights and proposes to replace it with life rights. Uh, and he says that, um, uh, he says that uh, hence comes the shift from uh, human rights to life rights or the rights of life itself, uh, an idea that is connected with the right to life in contemporary world system that unfold mainly in the sphere of the economy, right? The ethics of the corpor corporations violates rights of nature and violates rights of the humans in the name of development. And this is what we have to question. Development rather than justice, rather than democracy, legitimate violations and legalize what would be considered illegal in all other situations. So the formulation of the right to live or life rights instead of human rights presupposes putting economy and law, uh, pu pushing them aside, so to say, making them serve life as such and not the other way around. Uh, so it just shifts, shifts this pow uh, power kind of... Um, uh, 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 as having made nature into the object of exploitation, modernity exiled into the sphere of nature and labeled as costs everything and everyone that was to be exploited. Uh, and here, of course, Mignola uh, draws heavily on a Merindian concept of uh, summa causae, uh, as well as Rolando Vasquez, uh, uh, originally from Mexico but living in Europe. Uh, and Rolando does it in a, in a wonderful way in his uh, um, le latest series of articles wh where he writes about this concept of buen vivir in Spanish or good life. But it's again, it's a very bad translation because when you say good life in English, you immediately imagine successful, materially successful life. And this is not what is meant here by Buen Vivir and by Suma Kausai. Rather, it's a life in harmony with uh, the universe, with nature, with other people, with other beings, not only human beings. Uh, and, and it has nothing to do with material success, of course. Uh, so it's a tricky thing, this untranslatability of these con concepts. Uh, and um, uh, what all of them stress is that we need to focus more, again, on institutions that are not false, that are not kind of losing their connection with reality, uh, not institutions that were created uh, from top, but rather what Bharta Chatterjee, Indian political scientist, called many years ago in one of his books, The Politics of the Governed, he calls it political society. Not civil society, but political society, meaning all of this and not NGOs, but social movements that come from below. Uh, and uh, uh, these kind of activities of people which cannot be fit into the, uh, uh, either the model of the state or the model of the market or anything that is ruling today. So it's all about this politics of the government. It's all about this political society that deals with life rights, with survival, with human dignity, rather than any formal things that are covered by the so-called use gentium, yeah, the, the right of the nations that was formulated and still is used, of course. Uh, another th model that I would like to mention very, very briefly is described by Silvio Marcos, 
my dear friend and colleague uh, from Mexico, Mexican anthropologist who uh, knows uh, everything about Zapatista movement and actually spends months living there with them in the, in the Candon forest and write a lot of stuff on that. So she was one of the first who wrote about this principle of parity instead of equity. And that's interesting that for, for Zapatista women, there is no egalitarianism. They don't like it. They, they don't like the idea of gender egalitarianism. And instead of that, they talk about parity because they, they say that no two human beings are identical and equal. They're all different. And so it's wrong to talk about equity in the sense of being identical. Uh, so yeah, we do have the same rights, but we're all different. And being equal uh, allows you to be different. And uh, that's why for them it's always important to talk about a changeable, flexible, balanced, a state of extreme dynamic tension and not a pragmatic compromise between the opposites. Uh, for Zapatistas, equality means stagnation and actually death as they think that, yeah, nobody is actually totally equal. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, shift that we find in a lot of indigenous feminism, especially in, in uh, South America. Uh, correlationality that I already mentioned several times today is another thing that you find in so, so many indigenous cultures. And Maria Lugones, our uh, preeminent decolonial feminist, was one of the first who introduced it in her works back in the 90s and now as well. So she actually uh, uses this principle of correlationality together with Rolando also and his works uh, to ground what she calls deep coalitions. I like this concept of deep coalitions and I work more and more with it uh, and sometimes question it also. So these deep coalitions, they can potentially be a way for constructing horizontal alliances of those who are excluded from this equality discourse and forced to compete in the predominant agonistic model. And that is another thing that I think is very important in, in our trying to understand what it means, this equality discourse, and why it's so meaningless today. Because modernity, uh, with its colonial side, is very much based on the principle of agonistics, agon, yes, this, this uh, rivalry. Uh, so Lugones was one of the first that wrote in one of her essays about negating this agonistic principle, stopping competing with other people, and instead of that, using the principle, as she, she says in that essay, um, traveling along other people's worlds with a loving perception instead of agonistic. So you come to that world of another, not with the idea of competing and fighting and becoming and, and carving a better space for yourself in this modernity, but rather with an idea of building some sort of coalition. And I think this is one of the major problems today for many uh, contesting discourses, because there are many groups that are taking the standpoint positions and criticizing modernity from their particular local histories. But very often they don't find a way of building these deep coalitions, unfortunately. Yeah, because everybody fights for their uniqueness and saying, okay, I am the victim of modernity and uh, my suffering is more important than yours. And that is a very weak point. In, in many of the situations because that allows modernity to still divide and rule and win in all of these situations. And uh, um, as a way of conclusion, I wanted to give you one example just simply because I'm working with it now. Um, it, it, it has to do with a lack of dialogues or impossibility of dialogues between uh, post-socialist feminism and post-colonial feminism because this is what I'm uh, writing on now, actually with my two co-authors, that some of you know them, Suruchi Thapar Bjorked, who is uh, originally from India, but she's professor uh, of political science in Uppsala University, and Redi Kubak, who's originally from Estonia as a post-socialist country, right? And so we are working together on this, and this is a result of our reflection on one conference that we had in Linköping University four years ago, almost four, three and a half years ago. It was intended as a dialogue, a possible dialogue between post-colonial feminists and post-socialist feminists. And it was a complete failure. It was one-sided because many post-socialist feminists from Eastern Europe came and they were all 
interested in post-colonial discourse. They knew all the categories. They all read their Baba and Spivak, you know, and could quote it easily, and also applied to their situation. And so there were a lot of really serious political discussions, uh, not only political, others as well. Like we are post-colonized, you know, we are the new post-colonial others. We're treated as post-colonial others of Europe. Uh, and that was, I mean, relevant, although, I mean, I had some questions because I'm not white, I'm not European, and so I also felt sort of uh, othered in that situation, yeah, because I'm post-colonial in the true sense of the word coming from tr two Russian colonies, non-European colonies. Uh, while that was more like a uh, European talk, even if it was questionable if you, if you look at uh, internal European hierarchies, right, of course. Uh, but it's interesting that there was no uh, reciprocal action from the part of post-colonial feminists. Uh, for, to begin with, we had only two or three people who could be seen as post-colonial uh, feminists coming, and none of them attempted to engage somehow in reflecting on uh, this socialist situation, you know, like uh, criticizing it or the opposite or so kind of the trying to find some connections. And that was really interesting for me. I started thinking about it. And I, since then, I wrote two or three articles on that, and now we're reflecting together with my colleagues. But I think it's a very good example of this lack of, of equality discourse and lack of uh, uh, equal rights, even if you speak about such presumably open groups as transnational feminism, you know, this, because, you know, wh when people say transnational feminism today is a euphemism of post-colonial feminism, very often, right, because there's no such a thing as post-colonial feminism as a school, but when we're, we're especially in the American context, when we read about transnational, what is meant is non-white feminism, non-European feminism, uh, women of color feminism. But in these discourses, as several theorists shown, uh, and one of them, of course, Jennifer Suchland, uh, in her book about uh, uh, women trafficking, sex trafficking in post-socialist world, I mean, it's obvious that uh, it's already an, a, an established discourse, this transnational feminism, which doesn't want to allow any more others into it, so to say. And very often we find, the post-socialist women find that we, we have no place there. We can't really join this. Or if we do, we are totally misunderstood and our experience is totally misrepresented or distorted, you know, or seen as something really uh, weird because, of course, it's weird if you compare it with a, with a classical post-colonial situation. What we went through is sometimes the opposite. And I will finish with an anecdote, a uh, very short one, and you can reflect on that. It's actually a true story. It's not a, an invented story. And I, uh, I was told this story by a friend of mine from India, uh, a very interesting person who lived in Soviet Union in 1970s and 80s, and she wrote a book about Russian Orientalism, criticizing Russian slash Soviet Orientalism with, with really good basis because she worked in archives during perestroika times when it was still possible. And this book was, she wanted to publish it in Russian, but of course they didn't allow her. And she finally published it in English. So Kalpana Sahni is her name. She's a famous Indian scholar. She told me that her son uh, married uh, a woman whose parents came from India to London. And so they established themselves, got an education. It's a typical post-colonial success story. You go to the former metropolis, you become a doctor, an engineer, I mean, wonderful. Uh, and of course, I mean, they, they have certain specific positionality still because uh, they consider themselves successful, but they realize the difference even in the way they look, you know, in the way people uh, treat them in Great Britain. Then what happens is Kalpana comes to visit them and she finds out that they hired a servant and the servant is from Lithuania and the servant is totally uh, looking different, right? And, uh, and I already have a problem with that because mm -hmm. deep there there's still a racial thing, a racial difference and so they don't know how to treat her and that's what Kalpana could see because she had some experience in the Soviet Union and so she could remember how it worked there and then. And then at some point this woman comes uh, yeah, and, and also we find out that she made the opposite thi thing for her. It was not coming up uh, the, the social ladder, so to say, but the opposite because she had a uh, high education in Soviet Union. She was a famous marathon runner, like a champion, and there she works as a cleaner in this family in London. And then she said, can I go early today because my son came uh, with a philharmonic orchestra 
and apparently he's a member of a Lithuanian Philharmonic Orchestra who came to London and is performing and she wants to go there. And I mean, they were all nice people and they found uh, a way of, of dealing with that. But it's interesting that they were shocked because Kalpana was talking with her relatives after that and they couldn't make sense of this because in their uh, world vision, so to say, it should be the opposite. The logic should be the opposite, even if we criticize colonialism and neocolonialism, post-colonialism, whatever. But still, there is a certain logic and uh, this logic is connected with some idea of progressivism uh, you can question it, but still is there. Well, in this case, it was just the opposite. You know, from some kind of forced progressivism, you come to this situation of limbo, uh, where nobody cares about your education, your European belonging, your nothing. You're just there in this position of thrown, kicked out of modernity, let's say, of history. So this is an interesting thing that not many people theorized fully, I would say. Especially if we speak not about Lithuanians, that is more or less known. I mean, there are interesting theories there. But if we speak about people like me coming from Central Asia or the Caucasus, because there, there, there is no post-colonial theory or decolonial theory. And this is an interesting situation of people who were um, kind of made into the honorary second world <laughs> by Western modernity. And then finally, all of a sudden, they find themselves being thrown into the situation of the third world again, but not many of them agree with that because there was a different system, a different schooling, a different identification and self-identification. And it's an interesting uh, conflict there going on. So uh, what I'm telling you is just one small example, but there are so many you know, complex things there that question this idea of egalitarianism. And especially if you have egalitarianism on paper, like in, in most socialist countries, and then you have the darker reality, the darker colonial side of how it actually was practiced or not practiced. So I think there is a lot of food for thought. And it's great that we have uh, the new generation of scholars here who will <laughs> hopefully tackle all this in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Medina, for this inspiring talk. Very brilliant. And I suggest that we open up to questions, not only short interrogative statements, as our rector says, but also comments, reflections. Uh, yeah, yeah, please ask. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not familiar with it in, uh, in terms of, of areas studies, I should say. So as an anthropologist, the mm -hmm. obvious example I can think of is the re-emergence of shamanism in Mongolia, for example, yeah. which could you know, perhaps uh, be a very fertile source. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just an open question of uh, what are the options for a decolonial option? Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a good question. Well, you know, when I first uh, discovered the colonial option for myself, it was in the late 90s. Uh, and I immediately felt that this is, I mean, sounds very familiar to how I feel myself, being a colonized other in Soviet Union and then in Russia, and always being rationalized, and at the same time, you know, having this westernized slash Soviet education. It's a very complex thing. And uh, I was also a colonial other in the sense that I was detached from my own cultures, both cultures, in the Caucasus, uh, where my father ca came from, the Circassian culture, the Adiga culture, and my mother from Uzbek and Tatar cultures. I didn't know the language because, you know, in Soviet system you had to learn Russian, of course, in order to get any kind of decent education. And for that reason I didn't belong to these cultures either, but at the same time I didn't want to be Russian and Russians didn't want to see me as one of them, 
uh, and they still don't. Uh, and so it was a very interesting thing because I, when I read Ansaldua, I felt, okay, this border also runs inside me. This is how I feel. And then, very difficult, with a lot of difficulties, I started going to both the Northern Caucasus culture and to Central Asian culture to interview people, to discover, you know, oral histories, this kind of things that are only, you know, th they're not in archives, of course, because the Soviet modernity made sure that it's all erased. But still, yeah, I could find people who told me about it. As in my book on gender, I used some of this. Uh, you mentioned shamans, but I also found, similar to shamans, I found uh, people who, in the Spanish tradition, would be called curanderas. Uh, like, you know, people who cure you of different things, and mostly they are women. So I found I both in Caucasus and in Central Asia, in Central Asia also some of them are religiously connected with Sufism, like Sufi saints who can, can be women. It's amazing, you know, when you talk with them, they're religious, kind of creolized views because there's a lot of merging of different religions and pre-Islamic things, a lot of interesting things. And, I, and of course, it, it's in them originally that I found this decolonial impulse because, uh, yeah, I discovered that all along they were never agreeing with modernity, with socialist modernity, but of course it could destroy you very easily. And so they invented ways of infiltrating this modernity, acting as tricksters. And then I found out that in my own family it was the same, you know, and I, that's why I started writing novels to begin with, because I wanted to rediscover my own history and then kind of look at it uh, against the background of, of larger picture of, of modernity and modernization in these regions. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was a very important and shocking experience uh, for me. And now I'm looking more and more in that direction in my new book that I hope I will somehow finish at some point, we'll be actually dealing with this indigenous land-based uh, cosmologies in the Caucasus, because this is what is being revived there now. Uh, you know, in the, in the Northern Caucasus, especially my people, my ancestors, the Digi people, they were tree worshippers. And so there is this very important culture of worshipping trees and forest gardens that were destroyed by Russian colonization, and now it's being revived. And the younger generation is really trying to kind of go back to that tradition, you know, and they actually replant forest gardens. They, uh, there are several social movements dealing with that. But it's very recent. It's only in the last maybe four or five years that's happening. And I'm really curious and I want to write about that and see how it will develop. Thank you. It's a, yeah, it's a very, very good example. And, uh, you know, you, it, re it reminded me of the time when I worked at uh, one of such universities in Moscow. Originally, it was called Patrice Lumumba University, People's Friendship University of Russia, it's now called. I, and I taught there for 10 years. And, of course, I was teaching already at the point when we stopped having people from the Global South, in, in, and because before it was like 75% of students were from the Global South. And now mostly they are from CIS countries, but there's some still from Asia, from several African countries, uh, from Middle East, 
let's say, yeah, there's still some students. Um, and it's a very interesting phenomenon because on the surface, of course, they're still fed with this proletarian internationalist myth or remnants of it, uh, although in reality they face racism all the time, all the time. I mean, it's, it's really very racist. Uh, and uh, you're right that when some of them cannot go back to their countries because they, they would never find a community. And so that's why a lot of them stayed. A lot of them stayed in Soviet Union. I have friends who graduated from Patris Lumumba University back in the 80s, and they are now very successful doctors and engineers. Uh, but it's not always the case, because there's always a community of, of people who got this indoctrination of Soviet modernity, let's say, and uh, some of them are very successful. They work in embassies of these countries, you know, and they, when we have, like, uh, official holidays, they come and they all visit, and there's, like, uh, alumni organizations and all that. But I think there's always this double discourse. Like, uh, there is something that you can read, uh, there is official ideology of this university and other places like that, but there's always always racism as well. Uh, and uh, and uh, one thing that is really touching is that they're still, uh, I mean, depending on how you look at it, they're still indoctrinated into this Russian language, of course, and that before they're allowed to go to the classroom, for one year they sit and they have these intensive Russian lessons. And after that, you see sometimes uh, people, you know, different students from different countries, foreign students, they, they use Russian as a, as a kind of <laughs> way of communicating because some of, I mean, they, of course, they're all different languages, like, and they can't speak English, for instance, because some of them are French and Spanish. And so the Russian, the broken Russian is their way of communicating. And I guess for these patriots, it's very nice that, you know, th th this there is one space where <laughs> Russian is still shared by international students. Uh, but you're right, it's a, it's a very, very important issue. And even recently in, in Sweden, I, was, I took a taxi a week ago, and um, in, in, s in my town in, in Sweden where I live, taxis are usually non-European, taxi drivers are non-European people, immigrants. And so there was this immigrant, and of course we started talking, I always talk with taxi drivers, so they talk with me, I don't know, and that's not typical in Sweden. Uh, and so the first question is, is are you, you were foreign? I say, yeah, I'm from Russia. Oh, good. My, my sister went to St. Petersburg and she became a doctor. And now she's a cardiologist in London. So we started talking and we immediately became almost friends, you know. <laughs> and it's interesting that this person was nostalgic about the time that he went to visit his sister in St. Petersburg 20 years ago. And he still remembers some Russian. So there is this really strange feeling, you know, and now... Uh, she's a successful doctor in London, and he's a taxi driver in Linköping. And he was very bitter about that, although he didn't want to discuss this. So there is this lost community of sense, I guess, <laughs> with socialist uh, modernity. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, of course I'm familiar. I can't say that I 100% uh, agree with that, although I use it, and actually we criticize this concept, but not in his interpretation in our one of our articles with this co-author, um, Suruchita Parbjorket. And I can explain to you why, because Munoz uses it in fr from a colonial position, of course, a colonial, and also from uh, a LGBTQ position, which is very important. But then, we think with Suruchi that the concept of disidentification was hijacked by white feminism and misused and misinterpreted and depoliticized today. And we use the, the example of the daily gang rape, remember several years ago it happened. And then after that, many European and American feminists said that they disidentify from this otherness. They don't want to have anything to do with that, you know. And that we find very alarming. So I think that, yes, Munio's concept is important, but we have to remember who formulated it, I mean, that it was him, and what conditions and why. Uh, while when people today just use it all the time, I, I find it problematic, the same way as with um, intersectionality, that is overused so much. Thank you.
thank you for your talk. I, I have actually a very brief question. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk about two concepts. The first one is neoliberal modernity, and the second one, um, the conditions of declining capitalism. So I would love to ask you to reflect on how we can think of both of them together, and also maybe um, how and how and if we can apply the concept of neoliberal modernity to contemporary Russia, to, to this particular post-Soviet post space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, that's an interesting twist because I'm not a specialist in economics, so um, I don't think I have uh, the right to talk about uh, capitalism in that you know, kind of, I'm, I'm not trained to do that. And actually, in the colonial option, we usually don't even use the term capitalism. I use it today, but normally we say economic coloniality because this is just one of, one of the sides of coloniality as we see it. Uh, but of course, it's very important to see this difference between, let's say, liberal modernity and neoliberal modernity and the way capitalism is developing today, right? And here I won't say anything new because we can read uh, all sorts of leftist theories on that and there's a, good, uh, a lot of good books written on precarity and this kind of stuff. Uh, and we know, of course, that today the, the concept of economics changes so much uh, and it means increasingly some virtual money instead of any kind of, uh, kind of real material things that it used to mean before. Uh, and this is one of the reasons, of course, uh, why it's declining uh, well, when I say declining, I mean that I look at something that is probably more familiar to all of us since we're at the university. What is happening with universities today? Everywhere, not only in Russia, but also in Europe and the United States. There are different degrees of turning university in, into a, a business venture. Yeah. So all of the basic principles of university as an institution that uh, not only gives you a sum of knowledge, facts, but also helps you to become a well-rounded human being and citizen. All of this is lost today. And uh, you know, in, in the majority of cases, the university is just thinking about making money. Uh, and uh, yeah, it becomes part of the neoliberal uh, capitalist system. And I think this is one of the very dangerous things of how neoliberalism kind of penetrates all spheres of society. And of course, uh, again, in different countries, it, it uh, develops in with different uh, speed, but it's a, it's a general tendency. If we look at Russia, Russia is a very strange hybrid case in that sense, right? Because on the one hand, of course, it's, uh, it's very neoliberal. Again, if you look at education, if you look at uh, other shrinking and dying spheres of society and social life, such as healthcare, for instance, and other th you know, things like that, uh, then it's an extremely uh, ugly um, version of neoliberalism. But on the other hand, of course, it's a, mm, it's a strange kind of neoliberalism, which is also connected with some, you know, uh, as we know, with five, six, seven people owing uh, everything in the country, right, and extreme poverty uh, with uh, this kind of state capitalist uh, schemes of uh, all of the state capitalist ventures like Gazprom and all of this kind of stuff. So it's, it's a weird combination uh, of these uh, very um, outdated ways of uh, you know, building political society and, and politics in general, and, and at the same time very, very neoliberal, um, uh, not only rhetoric, but also actually politics. And this is something that is very hard to explain in the West sometimes, you know, because I, when I talk with my friends, for example, and colleagues, even decolonial colleagues or leftist colleagues in the West, they don't get it because they take what Putin says very seriously. They don't realize that it's so populism and it has very little to do with what is really happening there. And so when I tell the stories about how universities develop in Russia now, they say, yeah, but this sounds totally neoliberal. Yeah, of course it sounds totally neoliberal. And people have to be rich in order to even get any kind of education today in Russia. And I think this actually is connected with this futureless situation. Like nobody cares about the future. Nobody wants to have any kind of research, for example, or and you know, that's why Academy of Sciences was killed in Russia, basically just destroyed in several years. 
so I think Russia, for me, in, in that sense, is a caricature of the West, as it often used to be and still is. So there are a lot of tendencies that in the West and Europe especially are kind of more mild, you know, hidden. You have to re really look hard in order to see how it works. But in Russia, it all works in this caricaturistic form. You can say, oh, okay, yeah, here you, you can see how you can destroy the universities and institution in three years, you know, basically. <laughs> and then for, but you just, you know, recent example, my former PhD student, a very talented young woman, a feminist, uh, she you know, works in um, this uh, mountain or mining university in St. Petersburg. And she was told that we're going to kick you out if you don't become a doctor in Russian system. There are two kinds of PhDs. One is like a level, uh, higher level PhD, doc doctoral, doctoral degree, real doctoral. And so she, was spe she spent six years writing this thick book and she wrote a very good dissertation. But then she found out at the last moment when she was already put in line to defend it uh, and that way trying to keep her position as a professor and be promoted, that the last free... Uh, PhD committee was closed in Russia. So if now you, if you want to defend a dissertation, you have to pay a lot of money because all of these committees take take this money to to allow anybody to defend. And and she was just devastated because she lost health. You know, she she was not having any social life. I mean, just writing this and working at three places to make the, the ends meet. Uh, and at the same time, there are many people who don't want to immigrate. You know, to go and we discuss this with her and I said maybe you should come to European one of the European universities and just, you know, do your PhD here, maybe another PhD, just to kind of have normal life for three or four years. But uh, there is, it's an interesting thing that there are a lot of young people there in Russia who don't want to immigrate. And I actually like that position too. They say, it's our country, why should we leave? Yeah, it's, we, we have to kick out these people who created this problem to begin <laughs> with. So it's also possible to be uh, proactive in that way, I guess. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. I don't know if it has shaped as a question in my head yet. Uh, I w um, so we talked a little bit about also what happens to concepts that travels and they might lose meaning or change at best. So I was wondering, in this uh, decolonial option that you're presenting and the vocabulary you're presenting, especially in relation to temporality, that the last slide you had there and that maybe we didn't go there uh, as much, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. and the futurelessness and so forth. I was wondering how you see your contribution in that sense and the risks of it being read from maybe from a Western perspective in terms of nostalgia, potentially, right? So it, the hege hegemony of modernity and, and the resistance to that becoming a form of nostalgia, which we've seen is not a very politically progressive um, way most of the time to go about. So was, I, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about this temporality, futurelessness, and what do you envision it could do also to a, let's say, say Western uh, thinking mode, I guess? Um, well, you know, when I formulated it, I was not really thinking about Western thinking or Western kind of paradigms. I was trying to understand what was happening there in s the ex-Soviet Union and think about it from that positionality from the position of someone who was born there and lived half of my life there, you know. Uh, so I didn't really care how it can or should influence the Western thinking because Western thinking cannot be, I guess, influenced by that because it has a different uh, local history and different logic, so, you know. But, of course, maybe it's good if uh, Western, I mean, in a collective sense, Western scholars would try to open their ears to this and, and listen to this different kind of theorization of a different experience, which seldom happens, of course, because they have their own uh, models that they impose on us. And that's why I think many post-socialist countries were struggling with this for so many, for 25 years, or always be seen as uh, catching up, yeah? They have to catch up with the West, they have to kind of develop, so this developmentalist discourse was imposed on them as well, not only on the global South, but on the socialist world as well. And, and that's why there was this bitterness and this post-colonial sentiment at some point when people realized, okay, we've been trying to catch up for 20 years, but instead of <laughs> catching up, we find out what that we are always catching up and we're farther away, we're still seen as second, uh, rate people and not true Europeans. And then I think this 
uh, post-colonial sentiment came into the post-socialist uh, discourse. And uh, uh, I started thinking about it actually, I think because there were so many people in Russia thinking about the, the future discourse and writing something about it. And also some immigrants uh, from the Soviet Union who are very famous uh, today in Europe, like Boris Groys, for instance, is one of the theorists, uh, art theorists and th philosophers, who wrote about that. Uh, and he, he has this idea that uh, instead of uh, you know progressivism that we were offered before, and this progressivism was forced and sometimes made us uh, you know, go through different stages of development, so to say, uh, very quickly. So instead of that, we are offered uh, uh, the rhetoric and the, the narrative of regress today, when this post-socialist other is forced to go back in time and to go back uh, to some kind of uh, imagined zero point and start from scratch again, this climbing along the ladder of modernity, but this time the correct modernity, not the socialist, but the liberal and neoliberal modernity. And of course a lot of people don't like this because that's why you read feminists saying, yeah, we don't need to, uh, to emancipate. We were already emancipated in the 1920s. You know, we had all the rights that the Western women just dreamed about at that point. And it's true. I mean, the question is how well the laws were implemented, of course, and what we got in the end. Uh, but this is a problem, I think, for a lot of people. And that's why sometimes there is this resentment and uh, unwillingness to kind of borrow anything from Western experience and this annoyance with Western scholars coming and telling us what to do and how to interpret our own past. In some countries you can see more of it, like in former Yugoslavia, for example, it's a very strong discourse now. Uh, uh, but in other, in other cases also, I mean, in, in Central Asia I found a lot of that because there were uh, groups of American and uh, Western European anthropologists, political scientists who were coming there to enlighten these nations, you know, and to save the brown women from brown men, as we discussed this morning at one of the sessions. Yeah, like uh, uh, how to emancipate. So it, it's interesting, and of course it's very easy to criticize this nostalgia and say, oh, people want to, to go back to socialist. Nobody, I don't, I don't think there are many people who really seriously want to do that. But what they are nostalgic about, in many ways, is this predictability of their lives, the fact that the socialist state, even if it was poor, it still guaranteed you some kind of basic things that today we don't have because we are so precarious, all of us, at all levels. Uh, so this is something that people probably are nostalgic about. But in many cases, I talked with these people, and I mean, I interviewed many people who are sort of nostalgic, and very often it's nostalgia about their on youth, you know, it's not a political regime that they're nostalgic, but okay, I was young, I was happy, I, you know, I had all the opportunities in front of me. It's not politicized. But then when you start talking with them, you realize at some point, but of course they're very critical of Stalinism, of this and that, but it's not what they choose to remember in many cases. What I am more kind of alarmed with is when the younger generation of people who have never lived in Soviet times, they use the socialist and Soviet kind of socialism as an ideal. Yeah, people who were born after the 1990s or mid 1990s or even 2000s, this often, I mean, th there is this brainwashing going on. And a lot of them come and, you know, with this kind of glowing eyes of, yeah, we have to go back to socialism uh, because they have no idea how it was. And that's that's a problem sometimes, I think. Yeah. Okay, yes. and one more question. Oh, we I guess time. we have time for. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, please bear with me because I do not have my thoughts really clear in my head. So I'll ask for your patience. I felt uh, a little bit interpolated uh, when you were talking about uh, post-colonial uh, feminists and also post-socialist feminists d talking with each other. And uh, my research project and everything I do is based in Lebanon, and I am from Jordan, and I'm actually half Czech, so so I have this bit of a messed up relationship to geography uh, and post-socialism and also uh, post-colonialism. So um, I was just playing with some thoughts as, as you were um, talking, and you know I, I, I think, at least in my region, we, t we tend to forget that we also have um, a relationship to socialism, right? And if we th think about Iraq and Syria, these are 
the two biggest nations that had a socialist regime for a long time, the Ba'athist regimes, um, and both of which have undergone severe bombing by um, Western forces. And so I think there are connections there in terms of not only the nostalgia that I think we have yet to see for the socialist uh, regimes that were destroyed at this moment. I mean, already you feel, you, s you meet a lot of people saying, we had everything we needed in Syria, look what happened. Um, but that's, I mean, the conditions are different, right? It's a war, it's, it's, it's not that. But perhaps we do share more of a futureless future um, than, than, we, um, than we think. Um, but then looking from the perspective of the refugees that are arriving in Europe, I don't necessarily think that they think of it as a futureless future. They are coming from the future less uh, past, let's say, into, mm -hmm. uh, into what they do perceive as a future, right? The shores mm -hmm. of Europe. Um, so it's a very different position. And I wonder if the person looking at them, since they don't have the right to look, is also seeing the past, the destruction mm -hmm. of a socialist uh, ah. In a sense, maybe, I, I don't know, because our regimes have also been quite neoliberal recently. Um, I mean, the entire Middle East is, you know, going uber-duber <laughs> neoliberal. Mm -hmm. So, but we did have very strong connections to socialist countries, right? Especially in the 80s and the 70s, there's so much exchange um, of students, of doctors, etc. Uh, you know, it's, it's really there in the foundations and those risks, uh, sorry, those ties have not been completely severed. So, but I just, these are just some thoughts I wanted to bounce off and mm -hmm. I, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, s uh, thank you for this because I was interested in precisely this opinion coming from this particular, you know, s local history. Because I was, as I said, I was also reflecting on this and I talked with several, let's say, post-colonial feminists, but mostly from India and also from Sub-Saharan Africa. And they said, we are nostalgic even if some of them did not have socialism in their own countries, but they had as an, as an ideal. And so when Soviet Union existed, even if it was false with all of this rhetoric, but people still saw it as a possible utopia. And, and so in that sense, they felt very bad when you know, it was close, this opportunity, a possibility, and only one was left, like neoliberal modernity. So that was the, the shock for them. Plus, of course, many of them didn't know much unless they were studying there and had their own first-hand experience. Uh, didn't know much what was socialism was like, you know, like this real socialism, and, s and there was no access to this knowledge. And so they're hesitant, I guess, of discussing this because there is a mixture of these things, like first uh, idealization, second lack of information. And so uh, they're very, very hesitant. But now I think it's growing, this interest and this need to reflect on your own socialist or pro proto-socialist or whatever past, you know, and how it connected with other examples of the so socialist world. Because recently, all of a sudden, I got a message of the people from India. There's a leftist journal there uh, who actually started uh, with focusing on this interconnections and intersections between socialism and colonialism and post-socialism and post-colonialism. And they asked me to write an article or something just out of the blue. I didn't know them. And then I discovered there are many people there talking about this and you know, reflecting. Uh, so I think it, it is coming with some delay. And I think this delay probably and this coming after the delay is also connected with this global situation that you started with, with this war and with this kind of... Um, you know, the fact that uh, nothing changes. I mean, history doesn't change. Uh, the same kind of war, the same bombings, uh, I mean, 20 years after Yugoslavia or whatever, you, you have the same rhetoric of this inversion of human rights. What, what it means is that it's enough if uh, a person or a regime is accused of uh, infringing upon human rights, it's enough to kind of deny human rights to this regime or this country or this state, then you can bomb, you can destroy, and this is a way of justification uh, that is used in NATO bombings, for instance, and you know, cases like that. And, uh, and this is interesting, I mean, how this uh, human rights discourse can be used as a vi violence, actually, and that's what happens today, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, it's time to close. Join me in thanking our speaker.